Hello, I'm Joe Chamberlain, the Executive Director for the Coastside Land Trust in Half Moon Bay, California. Welcome to our banana slug presentation, or as we like to think of it, the fantastic world of banana slugs. We're fortunate to have Dr. Jan Leonard with us today, who does research on banana slugs at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I would like to let you know uh, that there are reproductive activities in this slide and uh, each of you should choose uh, whether you're comfortable with that or not. Um, Jan, uh, lead us through this. It looks wonderful. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm Jan Leonard and today I'm going to talk about our friend the banana slug more from a research point of view. I've been working on banana slugs as um, my part of my scientific research, and I'm interested in, in, in banana slugs as um, a problem in evolution. My goals for today are to introduce the banana slug, discuss diversity within the genus, there are several species of banana slugs, and then talk about banana slugs as a model system for the study of sexual selection. Banana slugs are a group of species from the genus Areolemax. They're terrestrial gastropods. They're very large. They get up to 150 grams, which is about the weight of a mouse. They're common and conspicuous. They're omnivorous. They breathe air, but they're confined to moist environments. They drown in water, but they need um, high moisture in the soil and the environment. And they're one, what we call one of the charismatic species. They're famous in song, story, film. I've got a banana slug necklace. They, uh, you can have t-shirts, coffee mugs. There's the banana slug string band all kind, I even had a banana slug Christmas tree ornament. If we talk about the real live banana slug, I'm gonna quickly run through um, their natural history and then go on to talk about my work in sexual selection with banana slugs. Banana slugs, one of the things I like about banana slugs is one of their uh, one of the few gastropods that appear on postage stamps. This is a plate of uh, U.S. postage stamps from about 20 years ago showing the temperate rainforest to the west coast of North America. And here we have our friend the banana slug. They're also found in other habitats. Here, for example, is a picture of, of a banana slug. We had a serpentine spring habitat in Napa County. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they're also found right up to the coast. Here they are in Pacific Grove. I have found them at Pillar Point Harbor and at Nano Nuevo, right on the cliff just above the um, tidal spray. One of the things we know about banana slugs role in the ecosystem is that they're the major pollinator of our native ginger, which is a hermaphroditic plant. Banana slugs are hermaphrodites. So we have a case of hermaphrodites pollinating hermaphrodites. Native ginger, if you're familiar with it, is a low growing plant and its flowers appear under the leaves just about head height to a banana slug. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Okay, now I'm gonna introduce the late John Pierce. John passed away the end of July, unfortunately, and he's been my collaborator for many years with this project. This is one of John's favorite phenomena about banana slugs is that they do eat feces, human feces, animal feces, whatever. And the question is, what else do they eat? The more appropriate question would be, what don't they eat? They're omnivorous. They eat many part, kinds of plants. They eat poison oak. They eat mushrooms, including the death angel, amarita mushrooms. 
So if the students at UC Santa Cruz talk about kissing a banana slug, they'll make your lips tingle. I would not do that with a wild caught banana slug because they may have been in poison oak, they may have been in death angel mushrooms, you could get a very bad reaction. I've done it with my lab animals where I know where they've been for the last few months and it does kind of make your lips tingle, but I think that's the sticky nature of the mucus. They also eat various kinds of detritus. They have no objection to eating slow moving or dead animals. I once collected one that was chewing on a road map up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Major predators of banana slug include garter snakes, but only certain populations, salamanders and newts, birds and small mammals, and carnivorous snails and slugs. I think like many animals, when they're small, a lot of things will eat them. As they get bigger, they get what we call a size refuge in that they're too big for a lot of things to cope with. Moving into their reproductive biology, which has been my particular focus, like all of the land snails, they're simultaneous hermaphrodites. That is, each individual produces sperm and egg and functions sexually as a male and female at the same time. They have internal fertilization. That means they copulate just like mammals do. And they lay large yolky eggs. Here's an aerial Emax dolichophallus with its eggs. And here we have a copulating pair of another species, aerial Emax buttoni. Um, you can see each individual has the Genitalia are in the normal position for a gastropod to the right side of the head. And you can see the two peonies here connecting the pair. So to summarize, it's a small genus of large slugs from the Pacific coast of North America. There are currently eight known species, two of which have yet to be described. We're working on that. And they're distributed from San Diego County California to Juneau, Alaska. So here in yellow, we see the distribution. This is about Juneau, Alaska. It goes down the coast inland to Tuolumne County, where Yosemite is, out to the Channel Islands. And there's one little isolated population of what we think is a different species in Palomar Mountain State Park in uh, San Diego County. That has, is an isolated habitat of uh, the temperate rainforest, which is probably why they're there. I want to talk a little, I want to review some of your biology that you hopefully had earlier in your career and to explain what I'm talking about with genus and species. So, we're dealing with the kingdom Animalia, the animal kingdom, phylum Mollusca, the class Gastropoda, and there's a subclass Pulmonata. And within that, there's an order Stylometophora, to which, which is the land snails, to which banana slugs belong. They're in the family Arianidae, and we're talking about the genus Arialemax. Just for comparison, we've got, we'll look at do the dog family. There's the Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, the um, animals with backbones, the class of mammals, subclass Eutheria, this is the mammals with the placenta that we're familiar with, um, their order carnivora, their carnivores like cats and bears and so forth. And the family Canidae is, includes dogs, foxes, and so forth, and the genus Canis. So, for example, we look at the genus Canis, we've got the domestic dog with a lot of variation because of domestication. Canis rufus, the red wolf of the southeastern United States. Canis latrans, our familiar coyote. Canis lupus, the gray wolf of North America and Eurasia. And Cano mesomelis, for example, is a black backed jackal from Africa, and there are other species in this genus. So they're all quite similar looking. They differ primarily in size, uh, social structure, dentition, and some of the skeletal structure. 
Area Lemax, here are four of the eight species. Area Lemax dolichophallus, which is the Santa Cruz County species. Area Lemax californicus, which we have here in San Mateo County. This picture was taken in Grabtown Gulch. Um, Area Lemax button eye from the north and east bay and into Yosemite. And Area Lemax columbianus, from, which runs from extreme northern California up to Juneau, Alaska, has a very wide range. Now, this box of chocolate banana slugs from McKenzie's in Santa Cruz will show actually more morph uh, external morphological variation than you see in all the eight species of wild banana slugs. So how do, we how do we know that there are so many different species in banana slugs? Well, in general, there are three ways to distinguish species in a genus. The first one and the oldest one that has been used back to the days of Linnaeus is anatomy. In land snails, reproductive anatomy is the most important characteristic, and that's true in area Lemax. Nowadays, we use molecular data to look directly at the genes. And particularly useful in these studies has been mitochondrial DNA. But the ultimate test for distinguishing species is whether or not the, um, there can be interbreeding and um, fertile offspring. For example, we're all familiar with the example of horses and donkeys, which are different species in the same genus. Men can they can produce offspring, but those offspring are mules and are sterile because of differences in the chromosome number. So in area Lemax, the different species that have been described on the basis of difference in the genitalia. So this is a these show the reproductive system and dissections. We have area Lemax californicus, which has a long, robust penis with a long extension called an epiphallus. It has a big, wide uh, penis retractile muscle. This is the female end of things in these hermaphrodites. And this is the musculature whose stippling here is the musculature of the vagina. Um, if we look at dolichophallus, which is the Santa Cruz species, we see there's a much narrower penis retractile muscle, retractor muscle. The penis is just as long, if not longer, but much more slender. And for example, the musculature of the vagina is not as extensively developed. Other species, Columbianus and Strominius, have um, lack the epiphallus, and have the retractor muscle at the tip of the penis. So we have two subgenera within area Lemax that are distinguished by the morphology of the penis. We have here's an example taken from life. This individual is just finished with a bout of sexual activity. Here's the long, narrow penis. And this is area Lemax button eye from the other subgenus, and it has a short, thick penis with a papilla at the end and no long epiphallus. So this is how the species have been described. And here's just a list of the eight um, species. There's Columbianus, the most northern one, Button Eye, from the north and east bay out to um, Yosemite and down to Monterey County. Area Lemax Strominius, which runs from the Salinas River to Southern California, including the Channel Islands, and then an undescribed species from this, from this location in San Diego County. Our familiar ones here, Area Lemax Californicus, um, which is mostly San Mateo County, a little bit on the ed down to Rancho Del Oso in the, in the northern part of Santa Cruz County and out into the um, Stanford Golf Course in Santa Clara County. Brachyphallus is an interesting species found in the city of San Francisco, a little bit in Burlingame, and then isolated 
uh, populations in Pacific Grove down by Monterey and Cambria at Big Sur, we sort of suspect that these two populations are introductions maybe with garden plants. And then Area Limax dolichophallus, which is basically in Santa Cruz County. In this group, um, subgenus Medarian, there's another undescribed species that has been found at Fremont Peak. So the first question we want to ask is why are there so many species of banana slugs? And the answer is for most cases of speciation in the world is geographic isolation. Through geologic processes, um, populations become isolated, they begin to evolve independently and eventually separate into species. And we're pretty sure this is the case with area Lamax because the species boundaries and distribution of species is very similar to what we see in other organisms with low mobility that are found here on the west coast, such as some of the salamanders, many plants, and some of the other gastropods. So they're pretty much geographic, the species are pretty much geographically separated. We have Columbianus from um, Juneau, Alaska, down to the extreme north of California, then Buttonai in Northern California and into the Sierra. Um, a species called Strominius down here in, these are these uh, turquoise ones down in Big Sur. Um, these red ones don't show up well, the uh, Medarian species don't show up here. But um, this is our new species down at down at Palomar Mountain. Here, in more detail, we see here in Central California the various Medarian species. We've got Brachyphallus in San Francisco in the northern part of San Mateo County, Californicus here in San Mateo County, Dolichophallus down into Santa Cruz County. Again, a little population of Brachyphallus and Pacific Grove. And then Button Eye is found in the North and East Bay and uh, gets into uh, Monterey County a little bit. And then south of um, the Monterey Peninsula, we get Strominius. So, okay, we can distinguish between species on the basis of genitalia, and the question becomes, why do the genitalia differ? In 1985, a um, arthropod biologist who works with insects and spiders named William Aberhart predicted that where genitalia are useful taxonomic characters, that is, they are distinguishing characteristics for species and subspecies, sexual selection has been important. And this is true that genitalia are major taxonomic characters of many animals. In his insects and spiders, all of the stylometophoran gastropods and some other species, including some of the rodents. Um, it's also true of most flowering plants distinguished plants, angiosperms, flowering plants on the basis of their flower characteristics, which are genitalia. So we wanted to ask, is there evidence of sexual selection in banana slugs? So to test this hypothesis, we needed two stages. First, has there really been rapid evolution of genital characters? So to do that, we need some taxonomy and phylogeny that is um, evolutionary tree that is done independently of genital characters. The second question then is sexual selection important? We'll need to look to find evidence of sexual selection other than rapid genital evolution. So the first question, are species really distinguished by genitalia? And how do we do this? Well, the, the nowadays, when you want to distinguish between the species, you go to looking directly at the genes, usually the mitochondrial genes. And so we've done that with our banana slugs. 
And this is the technical information. We're looking at three genes on the mitochondrial cyto uh, CO1, 16S, and cytochrome B. And if we take tissue samples from the various, pop, uh, various alleged species of banana slugs and compare the, the structure of the genes, we get them sorted into two, um, sub, two groups that are similar to the, the subgenera, basically correspond to the subgenera described for morphology. But we got a couple of surprises when we looked at this. First off, we found out that what had been thought of as um, a single species from from central California, Yosemite, and so forth, clear up to Alaska, it used to be called Aerolimax columbianus, actually falls out into two distinct groups. This group and this group. These red stars indicate uh, statistically significant separation. And so we went and revived an old name for the southern group of Aerolimax buttoni. They'd been described at one point as distinct, but then uh, synonymized, that is thrown in with uh, Columbianus. And our evidence shows, the molecular evidence shows that these in fact are, dist are evolutionarily distinct, even though there's no evidence of uh, differences in the genitalia. So this suggests that they've evolved strictly by isolation. Strominius is distinct both within this um, subgenus, but distinct molecularly from either one of these groups and also distinct morphologically. And then we have the group Medarian, which were described as three species on the basis of their genitalia. And we find that there's just no evidence this group comes out as separate, but there's just no evidence from the, from the uh, genes, from the mitochondria, that they're separated at all. So they're morphologically distinct, that is anatomically different, but molecularly, genetically, we can't see a difference. So if we look at this subgenus Medarian, We've got the colors here indicate degrees of, of difference. We have very different genital morphology, and that is reproductive anatomy. Body color is sort of similar through them. Two of the species have small eggs that are similar. Dolichophallus has distinctly larger eggs. The mitochondrial genes are similar throughout. Hatchling color, um, Brachyphallus has dark hatchlings. These two have transparent hatchlings and they all have distinct sexual behavior. So at this point, we are satisfied that this, these, this genital anatomy does reflect species differences. So we've done that. We've answered the first question here and it suggests that at least in the subgenus Medarian and in the case of Scriminius, there has been rapid evolution of genital characters. Second question then becomes, is sexual selection important? We need evidence of sexual selection other than rapid genital evolution. So again, going to fundamentals, well, what is sexual selection? We think of sexual selection, we think of things like the peacock's tail, which is an ornament used by males to attract females, or we think of antlers and horns, weapons used by males in, in species with separate sexes to establish dominance and fight over access to females. As Darwin defined it, that these characters are the result of sexual and not of ordinary selection is clear as unarmed, unornamented, or unattractive males would succeed equally well in leaving a numerous progeny if better endowed, endowed males were not present. So the ultimate test would be to do an experiment where you compare the reproductive success of a male without a particular 
character that you think is sexually selected, such as a peacock's tail, with in the presence and versus absence of other males that have that type, that characteristic. But it's very rare that you ever get that um, sort of experiment done. So in most of the work on sexual selection, we look at, at somewhat indirect characters. As I mentioned, Neighborhart suggested that where you get rapid evolution of genitalia or very, and or very elaborate genitalia, you have sexual selection. Well, we've got that in there in the past. Another characteristic is elaborate and or expensive mating and courtship behavior. And we'll talk about that in area max in a minute. Other characteristics, you can look for high variance in reproductive success and either more both sexual roles. That is to say, some individuals are much more successful than others in acquiring mates and finding um, and, and producing offspring. Um, also, you can get differential parental investment. Nowadays, we look, we look at this sexual selection as going on even after mating and that there may be sperm from different individuals competing for access to the eggs. It all may also be the case that the female reproductive tract is selecting preferentially the sperm of some individuals versus others, which may explain some of these elaborate genitalia. So, we want to look at um, a little bit of sex movie here. So those of you who are particularly prudish, please look away. This shows um, 20 times normal speed, courtship and copulation in Aerially Maxtraminius from the big sur population. So the first thing that these slugs do is they find each other and then they start to circle. And since the genitalia are on the right side of the head, they need to get the right side of the head together and get lined up, which is what they're doing here. These marks are the way I mark individuals, which are one and four are happily meeting here. And you can see here in the swollen genital area of the head, occasional flickers of white, which are a penis and vas deferens starting to um, evert. Then eventually here at six times normal speed, we get an hour of reciprocal copulation and how we get withdrawal of these two penis. Here you can see peristalsis movement, muscle movement. There's one penis withdrawn. There's a second penis withdrawn. This individual is just kibitzing. If we, on the other hand, if we look at a, a different species, now this is the uh, Strominius is the subgenus Aerolimax that has the short blunt penis. If we look at Dolichophallus, which is the subgenus Medarian, which has the long thin epiphallus, the appendage on the penis, we see something quite different. Okay, we start out with the same circling behavior. This is common to virtually all the land slugs, even the ones that aren't closely related. And then in all of the Medarian species, we have about a two hour period of what I call biting and head swing. Individuals will bite at each other and then turn towards the site where they've been bit. And so this brings the two right sides of the head close together. Here you're starting to see a little bit of penis here. Now we've got here and here. Let me, let me pause that. Here and here are the two penis. And now there and there are the penis. Now they're in there, and then 
one withdrew and the other one's withdrawing and you see this long slender um, extension of the penis. Okay, and at this point I want um, those of you in the audience that have a um, Y chromosome and a, uh, and a penis to brace yourselves because you may find the footage disturbing. And two species that we know of, Aerolimax and Californicus, sometimes, about five out of 100 times, at the end of a copulation, something happens. And I'll, this will show you what it is. So we have, have here a pair that have been copulating. One penis has been withdrawn. And now the female acting individual here is turned around and started chewing i'm afraid and what's going this one doesn't liking it very much it's got its tentacles withdrawn there and now this female has just bitten chewed off the penis of its partner um so this is a behavior this apophallation is a behavior that was described first in 1915, some population of Californicus from Stanford Golf Course. And we still don't really know what the adaptive significance is with, of this behavior, partially because it doesn't happen very often. It happens about five out of a hundred times. And so we've seen it in two species, but we don't really understand um, yet what's going on. One possibility will be to start, we'd have to look at reproductive success of individuals that have or haven't lost a penis, and that's going to take a long time. However, what we do know at this point is that the sexual behavior in the area lamic area Lemax does suggest sexual selection. That is, it varies greatly by species. We have, I showed you two species in which is different. If you look within the, the subgenus Medarium that Dolichophallus, that last species looks like, or is, is part of, um, we have Dolichophallus, which you've just seen. We have Californicus, which is uh, has the same courtship behavior two hours of this biting head straight swinging but then when they copulate one individual is male and the other is female and they instead of copulating for two hours they copulate for about 20 minutes and then in california state change sexual roles so that the first indivi the individual that was male first becomes female, the individual that's female first becomes male. And the record that I've seen is about seven copulations of alternation sexual roles. And this can take up to, my record is like 15 hours. So it's, it seems like an expensive behavior and that its length takes a long time. It's complicated and it's often very energetic. In addition to the biting and head swinging, which is a pretty vigorous behavior for slugs, it's also the case that during this whole process, individuals are producing mucus and they wind up sitting on a bed of mucus. And then there's evidence that that's expensive and that after copulation, the individuals usually eat the bed of mucus, suggesting they're trying to recycle um, resources. Then we have this bizarre behavior of apophallation, which is actually what first attracted me to this group. Um, we had no suspicion of uh, other evolutionary questions, but it seems like where there was apophallation, sexual selection. Another thing we're doing right now as part of our work in progress is we're doing some crossbreeding experiments with these slugs to establish whether or not there is reproductive isolation between various species. 
However, since these individuals, since the, at least some of these species can self-fertilize with simultaneous hermaphrodites, you have to use molecular techniques to paternity analysis to determine whether or not babies that turn up in a crossbreeding experiment are a result of self-fertilization crossbreeding. So that work is still in progress. And so I thank you for your attention. Hi, Jan. Hi. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. We've got a couple of questions for you. Um, one is from uh, Ronald Welf, and he's curious about, are, there, are the banana slugs related in any way to either the sea slugs or the nudibranchs? Yeah, the sea, both the, um, the, the order Stylometaphora is part of the subclass Pulmonata. The um, pulmonates are related to the epistobranchs, the sea slugs, which are part of this system. So you've got a subclass pulmonata and you've got a subclass, um, and you've got a subclass epistobranchia, but they're all part of a group within the gastropods called the euthenura which means straight nerves. It has to do with the anatomy of the nervous system. But that entire group is simultaneous hermaphrodites as opposed to most of your marine snails, your abalone, your uh, urban snails, and your punks, and variety of marine snails, and limpets, and so forth. Those are, those typically, not always, but typically have sex, separate sexes. So it's a, it's a big group um, within the gastropods, and these are all related, but at a relatively high level. It's sort of like the euthenera in mammals, where the mammals with placenta are a um, are a group, as opposed to the marsupials with the pouch and the monotremes that lay eggs. So they're related at kind of that level. Thank you. Um, Steve Reddick has a question. He says, fascinating, Jan, thanks. And um, can you estimate the total population of, of A. Californicus in, for instance, a square mile of favorable habitat like Paris or Redwoods? Short answer, no. And the reason is, John and I, when we first started working on um, banana slugs, that was one of the, John particularly being a field biologist, first thing we thought, well, we need some population estimates. And then we found out two things. One is that banana slugs will go down burrows. They've been found down as deep as nine feet in animal burrows. They don't actually make burrows themselves, but they can mute, they will go down the burrows made by other animals, presumably to look for moisture environments. Um, the other thing they do is that particularly in wet weather, they will climb trees. I've seen them up probably 80 feet in, in trees. And so with that kind of vertical distribution, walking a transect to estimate population is kind of hopeless, and so we haven't done it. But this is one thing, there's keeps question keeps coming up, is that is banana slugs in the fires. Um, okay, banana slugs cannot outrun a fire. I don't know that they have any way of sensing a fire coming in time to escape. However, in the summertime and particularly during a dry year such as we've had this year, they will go down burrows and they will go down into creek beds. And so I'm kind of hope, I assume that with the fires there's been a big, there's been a substantial loss of population in the affected areas, but I'm hoping and trusting that a lot of the population was already down below ground in animal burrows where they'd be protected from the fire. Not so much to avoid fire, but just to find a moist environment where they could survive during a dry period. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, 
Jonathan has a question. Is it possible to non-destructively sample slugs for genetic material? Well, I don't know about non-destructive. The way we do it typically is we cut off a little tiny piece of the foot. There's a little edge around the foot that um, take a pair of scissors and just cut off a tiny, you don't need much tissue for genetic analysis. So you've got a, you've got a pretty good size why you can just cut off a little, a little bit of the edge and use that for genetic analysis. So that's what we typically do. Okay. Uh, Tony Corelli is uh, wondering how long uh, do banana slugs generally live? This is an interesting question. Um, also an example of the problems you have with the internet. Someplace, sometime before I started doing this work, so more than 20 years ago, there somebody posted on the internet the figure that banana slugs live seven years. And I have talked to just about everybody that's ever worked with banana slugs to ask what they know about that. And nobody knows anything. So as far as we know, somebody just pulled that out of their hat and put it in the internet and it's perpetuated itself. What I do know is that I've had individuals hatch in the lab and still be alive after three years. Most of the group that hatched at the same time will be gone, but I've had a few individuals survive as long as three years. My suspicion is that what happens in the, in the, in the uh, field is banana slugs lay eggs after the rains start in the fall because they, they don't have a hard shell like a garden snail's eggs. They have a gelatinous egg and they can't dry out. So once the soil becomes moist, the banana slugs lay eggs. It takes them about seven weeks in the lab at 20 degrees centigrade to develop in the field in the wintertime. It's going to be cooler than that. So probably takes two, two and a half months for them to develop. So they're going to hatch and eggs laid in, say, November, are going to hatch out in February. They're going to grow up depending on the rate, depending on the conditions. And I think the individuals that grow fastest will probably be ready to mate by the time the monsoon moisture and heavy fog comes at the end of the summer. This has not been a normal year, but typically we have a lot of heavy fog and monsoon moisture in August. And that's an active period for mating. So they start mating probably about six months old in August um, and then may lay eggs that next when the rains start. Other individuals, if maybe they're not in such a favorable location or they've, um, they're just genetically slow growers, may not be big enough to mate and lay eggs that first year and may um, take another year to may, uh, mate and start mating and laying eggs in that second year. And probably quite rare on the field that they would live three years, but it's certainly possible. Piggybacking on what, what you're talking about with the climate, did droughts, how, or how do you see that the droughts are impacting the banana slug? Well, droughts impact banana slugs the same way they impact just about all of the temperate rainforest. They're going to inhibit population growth. They're going to inhibit reproduction. Um, now, there have been droughts over history, so they've been through periods of drought, you know, the, the species have been through periods of drought before, they've been through periods of fire before, but we're in the, here on the west coast, we're in the middle of a prolonged, or we don't know when the end will be, but we've been experiencing a prolonged drought over the last 30 years where we've had below average rainfall and so forth. So it's, um, it's probably restricting um, 
maybe reducing the amount of uh, habitat available since it reduces the extent of the rainforest. That, rel that population down at Palomar Mountain State Park is in San Diego County is a relic population. That is that it, uh, there's a little bit of Douglas fir and temperate rainforest in that elevated area. And it's a remnant of a system that ex once extended as far south as Baja. The big, the big threat is gonna be loss of habitat from human activity. Turning all of these um, temperate forest locations into housing developments and shopping malls and so forth. Got a number of questions about um, following your work, but I know that you will be doing a, a follow up. Um, will be the questions that are not answered today. Uh, Dr. Leonard has offered to answer these questions, and we'll be posting those up online in the next few days. So, if you didn't get your your question answered, one question though I think needs to be answered today, which is, does the penis regrow after it's eaten? No. No. Okay. Another thing I didn't mention. Um, is that we found out that there are popular, one of the things that we've discovered during our work is that there are populations of banana slugs and at least two, possibly three species in which certain individuals are born without a penis. They can produce sperm, but they're born without a penis. This is fairly common. It's evolved about 17 times in the Stylometophora, is that order? And it seems to be associated with cases in which um, for various reasons, populations tend to move towards self-fertilization, um, self possibly because of low density. So that if you're going to be self-fertilizing anyway, um, individuals that don't invest a lot of energy in making a huge penis are going to have more energy to make eggs and survive. Um, we've seen individuals that have lost a penis through apophallation copulate as females afterwards. Obviously, they can't copulate as males. Thank you. This has been a fascinating presentation. And, um, and I, I know I've learned a lot. I can imagine that a lot of us are learning a lot and a lot, a lot of questions that we'll be following up with. Um, so thank you, Dr. Leonard, for being here in this presentation. Thank you for your, the opportunity and your attention. And thank you all also for being here and attending um, this presentation. We're glad to have you here in this, this really, really educational um, free webinar series. And for, again, you'll be, for those of you who are registered for this, all of you and, um, and your friends, we will be sending out an email um, in the next couple of weeks or a couple of days um, with questions and also the recording of this. So you'll get a chance to look um, and review anything that you missed as, as we were going along or you can share with, um, with friends that you think would be interested. Um, this will also be up on our all of our social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. If you're not connected to us on social media, I would encourage you to do that because you'll get to hear about some of the upcoming webinars that we have coming up. We have a really interesting one coming up um, at the end of October, beginning of November, a webinar series with Dr. Uh, Dan Costa from UC Santa Cruz as well. And he's going to be sharing with us about some of the research that they're doing on um, tracking marine mammals. and specific um, talk on uh, the elephant seal, the northern elephant seal, and climate change, how climate is affecting um, the animals and has you know, so the projection of that. So please join us for that. And if you get on social media or if you're on our mailing list, you'll get to hear, you'll get a, a, an email about that. Um, and if you have been donating, thank you. And if you haven't had the opportunity to do that, as, you, uh, as we all know, this is a really important time for us to be focused on the conservation of land and um, and Coastside Land Trust. This is the dedication to preserve this land in perpetuity. So this is an important um, organization to be investing time and also um, money into to keep this um, this organization running and doing the good work that it's doing. So um, the, uh, there's a link in the uh, chat for how to 
how to donate. Um, you can also hop on our website. And if you have any other questions that are, you know, lingering and you haven't typed into the question and answer section, please do um, send those our way and we'll make sure we get those to Dr. Leonard if you get those in the next couple of days. Um, and for those of you who are interested in following her work, we'll make sure we put a link on there for how you can follow her as well. So thanks again for being here with us. We hope to see many of you again at the Marine Mammal uh, presentation at the end, our webinar series. So a few uh, webinar presentations at the end of October and beginning of November. All right, thanks again.